Father, we come in the name of Jesus, thanking you for this, our Constitution Keeper program. And we pray, by thy spirit, we will witness a mighty anointing of God as we take on the God of this world. Father, we're declaring thy victory tonight. In Jesus' mighty name, your word declares, not by might or by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. And as we move on in thy glory, yes, as the song declares, make us mighty again. Our nation, Father, has been under a curse. It has forgotten thee. It has forgotten thy constitution, the promises of God, sworn unto thee by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Father, we come to thee tonight knowing the victory, however, is ours. In 2016, Brian Mason stood on the cliffs of Dover, the white cliffs of Dover, declaring an end to EU domination. But now, over these coming two years, the last two years of a world remotely like the world we have known in the past, we know, Father, that Thou hast called Thy church to make it stand your word declares whatsoever we shall bind on earth is bound in the heavenly realm whatsoever we shall loose on earth is loosed in the heavenly realm and so father we acknowledge the authority thou has given to us yet not us but thee your word declares in Galatians 2.20 that we are crucified with Christ. That we live yet not us but the Christ. The Christ victorious at Calvary. Oh, how we make our stand today in Jesus' mighty name. Father, thou gave us this wonderful word to stand against the EU against all natural odds the intercession was won at Dover and Runnymede the place of Magna Carta we're grateful too for former MEP Daniel Hanan for this wonderful book A Doom Marriage Britain and Europe how we stood in these constitution programs one after another intercessions all over the country and the world so as to bring an end to the doomed marriage of Britain and Europe now father as we come and witness this global agenda you have called us to back up what we say father in thy name giving us clear wisdom and direction that we are not just to be another conspiracy program for we are to speak the word of the Lord exposing the conspirator and all his ways Father we come today in Jesus mighty name knowing the victory is ours knowing the victory is ours and as we expose the devil's ways, Father, we pray that by thy spirit thou should convict the people. Thou should convict the homosexual. Thou should convict the heterosexual. Thou should convict the black man, the white man, the yellow man. For your word declares that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God but you also declare Father in John 3 16 that you 
so loved the world that you gave your only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in thee shall not perish but have everlasting life. Your word declares for whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world and this is the victory this is the victory that overcometh the world even our faith faith being the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen we're here tonight to set the captive free and declare the victory of the Lord Jesus. Father, the monarch of Great Britain came unto thee in Westminster Abbey in the year of my birth, 1953. A great possession occurred along the streets of London towards the Abbey where solemn oaths were to be spoken in front of thee. Father, it's an honor to live in a nation whose constitution, written constitution, despite of what the critics might say, we've got an unwritten, no, we have not. It is written, I have it here before us. The Archbishop asked the monarch, Will you, to the utmost of your power, maintain the laws of God and the true profession of the gospel? Will you, to the utmost of your power, maintain in the United Kingdom the Protestant Reformed religion established by law? Will you maintain and preserve inviolably the settlement of the Church of England, that is the Elizabethan settlement, Elizabeth I, and the doctrine, worship, discipline, and government thereof, as by law established in England. Will you preserve unto the bishops and clergy of England, and to the churches there committed to their charge, all such rights and privileges as by law, or shall appertain to them or any of them. Father thy monarch said all this I promised to do to uphold the Christian gospel. But Father as we consider the taking of the word of God which followed this solemn oath here is wisdom the moderator of the Church of Scotland declare. This is the royal law. These are the lively oracles of God. Well now, Father, in the name of Jesus, I declare that these lively oracles of God come against this woke culture, this build up to the sending of your son once more, Father, this time in triumph. We shall meet him in the air. But before that, Father, we know there are signs of the times taking place. That Brexit was just one sign. But now there has been some cultures build up originating in the 1960s. But now coming so strong before us. We know, Father, that this pandemic was indeed a pandemic. We're grateful to the LifeSite website, which declares that there has been a scientist who has fled China, who has declared, who has first-hand experience of the intentional release of, as she puts it, the Frankenstein COVID-19. But I believe that this has been a 
worldwide thing. One which has looked to bring the conditions for the new world order. Now I am careful not to go into theory, but to back things up with primary or secondary evidence more important by the prophetic word but i'm declaring to you today there is history of viral warfare not only from china but also in britain was it not porton down who set up grignard island off the west coast of scotland for anthrax trials amid sheep killing the sheep with anthrax was it not porton down who set a mild form of anthrax over the town of Weymouth. And yes, we read on websites of chemtrails, and they are difficult to prove of aircraft letting out viruses from the sky. But what is easy to prove is Port and Down's activity in the past. And this country, Great Britain, has indeed been involved with trials relating to viral warfare. We know from China, Wuhan, of the Institute of Virology. We have heard that some of its research even got funded by the Americans. And as we come to a presidential election, I know in my spirit there's two years before we see a major change in the world and the pandemic, as it's now called, is a build-up to bring the conditions for one world order for we're going to see a financial collapse like never before. Oh, we don't see it yet. We see little snippets of it but not the full impact. And there's going to be a cry out for a solution and that will be presented as the new global order. <coughs> one world government, one world religion. How can you prove this? We can see it from the signs and the times. We can see it from the Churches Together unit, which followed the United Nations, bringing about a United Nations of religion in the year 2000. We are seeing this in the Masonic agenda. A one world religion. A one world order. Satan versus God. The build-up for this one world order has come in what has become known as the woke culture. And I'm grateful to Douglas Murray and his excellent book, The Madness of Crowds. For he comes to describe certain minority parts of society and he seems to be bringing out that there is an agenda behind taking minority people groups and he has chosen a particular people group called LGBT or gay. I believe that the LGBT gay agenda has great victims attached to it. The victims being homosexuals themselves. You see, you're not going to catch us out, New World Order, on this program. Because everyone expects us to give a real Romans 1, 1 Corinthians bashing of homosexual people, as it is perceived. But the Bible says, 
for God so loved the world, for God so loved sinners. I'm conscious of the story of the Good Samaritan, you know. And Lindsay and I have experienced this in our life when one homosexual came in and helped us when all the Christians all around us were keeping away from us. The BBC were out to destroy us with a program. And this homosexual came and helped us produce material to get the BBC to back down. They were out to destroy us. I'm conscious of the story of the Good Samaritan. I'm conscious for the homosexual couple who helped us on street stalls in Colwyn Bay, making the stand for the country they loved against the tyranny of the EU. Let me tell you this. I'm conscious of our Lord's parable of the Good Samaritan. I'm not sure it would be the professing Christian who would help us if they saw us in the gutter. But these three particular homosexuals we know, we know would certainly help us. You see, there's more to it than meets the eye. Homosexuals are a very small minority of people in our nation. I think it's about 2 to 3%, yet they have a very big voice. But who is the they? Or is there an agenda? And Douglas Murray starts looking at what's behind the homosexual agenda. In his introduction of his book, The Madness of Crowds, Gender, Race and Identity, he writes as follows. We are going through a great crowd derangement, in public and in private, both online and off. People are behaving in ways that are increasingly irrational, feverish, herd-like, and simply unpleasant. The daily news cycle is filled with the consequences. Yet while we see the symptoms everywhere, we do not see the causes. He says various explanations have been given. These tend to suggest that any and all madnesses are the consequence of a presidential election or a referendum. But none of these explanations gets to the root of what is happening. For far beneath these day-to-day -day events are much greater movements and much bigger events, he says. It is time we begin to confront the true causes of what is going wrong. Douglas Murray is identifying the underlies. Even the origin of this condition is rarely acknowledged, he says. This is a simple fact that we have been living through a period of more than a quarter of a century in which our great narratives have collapsed. One great narrative is our own constitution isn't taught in schools i think the majority of people don't know what the queen promised god to become head of state says douglas murray one by one the narratives we had were refuted became unpopular to defend or impossible to sustain the explanations for our existence that used to be provided by religion went first what an observation you see i've given tonight the constitutional oath of the monarch and douglas murray said that doesn't count anymore it doesn't mean he thinks 
that that's right. He's just observed that it doesn't, and he's right. Falling away from the 19th century onwards, then over the last century, the secular hopes held out by all political ideologies began to follow in religion's wake. And in the latter part of the 20th century, we entered the postmodern era, an era which defined itself and was defined by its suspicion towards all grand narratives. However, as all school children, says Douglas Murray, learn, nature abhors a vacuum. And into the postmodern vacuum, new ideas began to creep with the intention of providing explanations and meanings of their own. It was inevitable that some peach would be made for the deserted ground. You see, religion had been removed and needed to be replaced by something. People in wealthy Western democracies today could not simply remain the first people in recorded history to have absolutely no explanation for what we are doing here and no story to give life purpose. <coughs> Whatever they backed, whatever else they lacked, the grand narratives of the past at least gave life meaning, he says. The question of what exactly we are meant to do now, other than get rich where we can and have whatever fun is on offer, was going to have to be answered by something. What an excellent introduction this is. The answer that has presented itself in recent years is to engage in new battles, ever fiercer campaigns, and ever more niche demands. To find meaning by waging a constant war against anybody who seems to be on the wrong side of a question, which may itself have just been reframed and the answer to which has only just been altered. The unbelievable speed of this process has been principally caused by the fact that a handful of businesses in Silicon Valley, namely Google, Twitter, and Facebook. Now, these businesses, in effect, are becoming the worldwide court, the worldwide auditors of all that we do. They now have the power not just to direct what most people in the world know, think, and say, but have a business model which has accurately been described as relying on finding customers ready to pay to modify someone else's behavior. Yet although we are being aggravated by a tech world which is running faster than our legs are able to carry us to keep up with it, these wars are not being fought aimlessly. They are consistently being fought in a particular direction. And that direction has a purpose that is vast. The purpose, unknowing in some people, deliberate in others, is to embed a new metaphysics into our society, a new religion, if you will. And within this, I believe, we're having what used to be called the philosophy of metaphysics manufactured by the metaphysical cults, that there is a belief system, yes, higher than that of the natural brain, but I believe in the realm of the metaphysical cults, there is a tuning into the enemy of souls, the God of this world, controlling the internet, the thinking of the internet, and now becoming the arbiter of all thought, philosophy, and ideology along certain lines, taking initially certain people groups. Now, do you see where this is going? Like the gay LGBT, like Black Lives Matter, 
that what we are witnessing here is something so great that if they can take over minority groups, and here I see genuine homosexual people as being victims of this, as black lives are being victims of this. For in it and behind it is a control that people no longer are able to speak against homosexuality or give a biblical or Quranic perspective of homosexuality. For no one else is allowed a view except that of the woke culture manufactured by those who have taken the world over by the internet, by a thinking which does not allow debate unless it is on certain lines. Says Douglas Murray, Although the foundations have been laid for several decades, it's only since the financial crash of 2008 that there has been a march into the mainstream of ideas that were previously known solely on the obscurest fringes of academia. Now, I see this clearly being written before the pandemic. I see this pandemic as a control to bring the conditions for the woke culture to fully take over <clears throat> not only the minority people groups, but also the majority who are being forced to believe certain ideologies and philosophies, else be taken off the internet, else be castigated as racist or homophobic, these words coming into our societies as words criminalizing people of a differing view. I believe I've got this right, and I'm grateful for Douglas Murray in bringing this out in his excellent introduction. He continues, the attractions of this new set of beliefs are obvious enough. It's not clear why a generation which can't accumulate capital should have any great love of capitalism. And it isn't hard to work out why a generation who believe they may never own a home could be attracted to an ideological worldview which promises to sort out every inequity, not just in their own lives, but every inequity on earth. The interpretations of the world through the lens of social justice, identity group politics, and intersectionalism is probably the most audacious and comprehensive effort since the end of the Cold War at creating a new ideology. It is almost like giving way to Hitler who had a certain view of perfection, had a certain view of of what he felt society ought to be, and anybody else who thought differently would be done away with. I believe we are dealing with the same spirits at large here. To date, social justice has run the furthest because it sounds, and in some versions, is attractive. Even the term itself is set up to be anti-oppositional. You're, suppo you're opposed to social justice? What do you want? Social injustice. So they make things simple. Yet anyone who studies philosophy and ideologies know it's not as simple as that. There are middle grounds to consider. Continues Douglas Murray. Identity politics, meanwhile, has become the place where social justice finds its caucuses. It atomizes society into different interest groups according to sex or gender, race, sexual preference, and more. 
It presumes that such characteristics are the main or only relevant attributes of their holders and that they bring with them some added bonus. For example, as the American writer Coleman Hughes has put it, the assumption that there is a heightened moral knowledge that comes with being black or female or gay. That's the point. You see, at the root of all of this is actually discrimination in all its evil. It is the cause of the propensity of people, says Douglas Murray, to start questions or statements with speaking as a gay person, black person, whatever. And it is something that people, both living and dead, need to be on the right side of. It is why there are calls to pull down the statues of historical figures used as being on the wrong side, and it is why the past needs to be rewritten for anyone you wish to save. It is why it has become perfectly normal for the Sinn Féin senator to claim that the IRA hunger strikers in 1981 were striking for gay rights. Identity politics is where minority groups are encouraged to simultaneously atomize, organize, and pronounce. Douglas Murray, you're getting to grips with it. The least attractive sounding of this trinity is the concept of intersectionality. This is the invitation to spend the rest of our lives attempting to work out each and every identity and vulnerability claim in ourselves and others and then organize along whichever system of justice emerges from the perpetually moving hierarchy which we uncover. It is a system that is not just unworkable but dementing making demands that are impossible towards ends that are unachievable. But today, intersectionality has broken out from the social science departments of the liberal arts colleges from which it originated. It has come from the universities. I'm speaking as one who refused a Manchester University degree in theology and Christian ministry because it was coming from exactly this position. It is now taken seriously by a generation of young people and, as we shall see, has become embedded via employment law, specifically through a commitment to diversity, in all the major corporations and governments. Now, this means if you're a charity which has a set purpose, just say, for example, you are an Islamic charity and you open an Islamic charity shop on the basis of looking to bring people into your faith and way of thinking. Now, traditionally, our country, our nation, Great Britain, has allowed freedom of speech. Now, for my understanding, the Quran forbids homosexuality. But what if a homosexual looks to apply for a job in the Islamic charity shop, which is set out to propagate the teaching of Islam? What happens then if the Islamic management refuse the homosexual job is that being homophobic or are you saying that you're not allowed to stand for your faith anymore continues douglas murray new heuristics have been required to force people to ingest the new presumptions. The speed at which they have been mainstreamed is staggering. As the mathematician and writer Eric Weinstein has pointed out, and as a Google Books search shows, phrases like LGBTQ, white privilege and transphobia went out uh, went out not being used at all 
becoming mainstream, forgive me as I just turn the page, as he wrote about the graph that results from this, the woke stuff that millennials and others are presently using to tear apart millennia of oppression and for civilization, was all made up about 20 minutes ago. And as he went on, while there is nothing wrong, we're sorry, we, we seem to, are we now back recording and are we back live? We seem to have had an interruption in our service. If you were watching live stream, we apologize for that. Yes, we're back live again. And welcome back to our program. We're going through the introduction of Douglas Murray's book, The Madness of Crowds. We've been establishing what the basis of this new woke culture is all about. We've been establishing the world's agenda. We've been establishing from the very outset of our program that we passionately believe that this pandemic is being used to bring about a one-world order, a one-world government along certain woke lines, that the constitutions of nations are being undermined. We read at the very outset of our program the constitutional questions from the Archbishop of Canterbury to Queen Elizabeth II, at Westminster Abbey in 1953. We've been comparing what she promised God to uphold to what has actually happened in her reign. We have seen that the 2008 financial crash was being used to bring people to a different way of thinking and that minority people groups were being stirred up to believe that they were being targeted and that they should rise up against the status quo, whereas no longer does all lives matter, but only black lives matter, and that discrimination is fine as long as it's on the minority side. We've covered also the almost impossibility now to stand up for faith I've even used an example of an Islamic charity shop, which if a person came either to volunteer or become an employee and was a homosexual, and that if the Quran speaks specifically against that sexual practice, then that particular faith could not do anything but employ that person if it was even if it was going against the Quran, which they would find abhorrent. Such as it is with Christians, of course. You know, we're having to fight for freedom of speech. And we're grateful to Douglas Murray for doing the research, identifying what is behind this in a sensible uh, and realistic way so we can grasp what is going on all around us and the bible tells us of these last days and i believe we're not far away from the invitation to take the sign of the beast as he went on continues douglas murray while there is nothing wrong with trying out new ideas and phrases you had to be pretty damn reckless to be leaning this hard on so many untested heuristics. Your parents came up with untested fields that aren't even 50 years old. In other words now, what Douglas Murray is saying is that we are being forced into ideologies which have never been tested. We put to you the Bible has outlived all of these ideologies and is the firm foundation for a nation and constitutionally is the foundation of Great Britain. But its people have ignored it to their peril 
And so ideologies have come in of a very young age, the people needing to be trained to forget their history, forget their foundations. And this has even come into the church with the emerging church, which talks of a paradigm shift. Peter Wagner, Rick Warren, being part of this New World Order plan, their part being to bring this into the church where they falsely preach Isaiah 43, to forget the things of old, but that was relating in context to the days of Babylon and slavery. We're dealing with something phenomenal here. It's even in the church. It's in our local church here at Whitholm, where false translations are taught that deny the Christ. But now the Bible's got to be changed to suit the new woke culture. Our local church here at Whitholm embraces the Nestle Land Committee and the Vatican and the Bible societies, which change doctrines to suit the culture and social conditions of the day, which includes this new woke culture. So it's in the church as well, says Douglas Murray. Similarly, Greg Lukanoff and Jonathan Haidt have pointed out in their 2018 book, The Coddling of the American Mind, how new the means of policing and enforcing these new heuristics have come. Phrases like triggered and feeling unsafe and claims that words that do not fit in the new religion cause harm only really started to spike in usage from 2013 onwards, it is as though, having worked out what is wanted, the new metaphysics took a further half decade to work out how to intimidate its followers into the mainstream. But it has done so with huge success. We in the Bible College of Wales see there has been a breach not only in society, not only in government, but most importantly, the church. And now we have the community church, which has a completely different ideal. It has nothing to do with God. It has everything to do in brainwashing and taking over the lives of the people. Now, we care about that. Our fighting for the people. We care for the people of Whitton, who to their credit, seem to have realized the hypocrisy in what is known as church. Let me say, people of Witton, you are very, very, very clever. But there is the true Bible. There is the true word of God. Let me tell you, you can trust this with all your heart, but you cannot trust those who've taken over church movements into this new woke culture, taken over political parties in this new woke culture, taken over our universities, even our schools. Look, we are not rich people here. We've had all our resources stolen from us. Lindsay and I have a new grand Wayne, that's Scots for grandson or grandchild. And we're having to consider having to get him have education out of the system, which is going to cost us. But we don't want him bought up in these new ideologies. They have no foundation. Their sand are going to collapse. And I believe this taking of minorities is actually abusing those minorities themselves. We're getting brainwashed with, I can't even watch a football match now without the woke bending the knee. What's that all about? To watch a football match, we've got to believe a certain way. Now, we are totally against racism. My God, we are. We hate it. We don't see no difference. If 
For God so loved the world he gave. Father, we come to you today in the mighty name of Jesus. Not by might or by power, but by thy spirit, saith the Lord. And our hearts are going out to all those affected by this new woke culture. Brainwashing our nation's children. Taking over ministry after ministry after ministry. Oh, Father, we come to you in the Lord's mighty name, the name of Jesus. Father, I believe the enemy has well and truly been found out. That we are brought to thee today. The desperation of the peoples of this world being taken in by this new world order, the deep states, or what the Bible declares to be the God of this world. Father, we come in Jesus' mighty name and say, let this be a time of great revival. Let there be a realization of what has crept in. Let there be understanding, Father, that we can witness before thee a move of thy spirit to bring men, women, and children unto thee. And Father, I pray that by thy spirit we shall witness a turning away from this woke culture back to the true word of God on the Antioch line, the inerrant word, the word without error, that that which has crept in be exposed for what it is and that we will see, Father, the greatest move of God in history to set free a world which has been taken over by this woke ideology, as Douglas Murray calls it, the new religion. And how we know it comes from the pit of hell. Thank you for joining us for this, our monthly Constitution Keeper program. We'll be referring to this excellent book by Douglas Murray over coming weeks in Probably most of our programs, we're grateful to you, Douglas, for pointing out the new religion. It's time now for the church to rise up. Didn't we read at the beginning of this program how responsibility was given to the clergy to ensure that the constitutional oath was carried out? how we need the church to rise up. Here at the Bible College of Wales Original Vision, we make our stand. We will not bow down or bend a knee to this new woke culture. We will continue to welcome all people to training here from all the world to come and read, study, and embrace the word of our mighty God, the foundation, the constitutional foundation of Great Britain and its Commonwealth and its wonderful Mayflower Compact with the United States of America. Thank you for joining us. We love you. God bless you. We'll see you again soon. God bless you.